uh, it is important to know where our roots come from. Who were the ancient people? What kind of language taught us? Why is it that we don't remember them? What is it that they didn't want to tell us? They are very much alive, even today. And Brian is one of their voice. It is, uh, he is a guide, and he organized marvelous travels and tour uh, on, in South America, Peru. And uh, he does a lot of lectures. I would call you modern Indiana Jones. Oh, thank yeah, you. Thank you. <laughs> kind of an artist. And uh, yeah, well, it's really fascinating stuff. So I'll let Brian talk about everything now. Okay, yeah. I, I have to say. Yeah. Well, thank you to all of you, and thank you to Denmark for this opportunity. Um, we've been through a lot of interesting discussions which are in some ways quite depressing, like what you see on the screen and what you still see on the screen. Um, and all of this, you know, all of this, all of this chaos and, and anger we have about the fact that we have been and are being lied to by so-called officials like this one as well. <laughs> and what I would like to do is, is I'd, I'd actually like to try to uplift you because history, as we've been taught in school, to some degree is a lie. And I wouldn't call it conspiracy theory, but what I would call it is cl uh, people closely guarding information and refusing to open th themselves up to scrutiny or other people coming in and offering additional information. And so this is the typical story we've been told about humanity, that we evolved from a primitive state to we being, quote unquote, the most evolved of all of, of existence. Um, and the same with society. We've been taught over and over that Homo sapiens, who, are, who we are, started out approximately 200,000 years ago, and for the majority of that time, we lived in this state of the hunter-gatherer. And then maybe 10,000 years ago, people got the idea to start living in a sedentary place, communally, and that now in the 21st century, we have the city of Shanghai. And this is supposed to be the ultimate example of the expression of humanity. The two places that I'm intimate with and want to discuss are mainly are Peru and Bolivia and also Egypt because they spiritually and in terms of tourism, etc., are, except for Egypt at the moment, the hottest places for people to go to in order to study ancient things. But the thing is that we have left the history of both of these places and much of the rest of the world, if not all the world, to a small group of people in general called archaeologists and anthropologists to tell us the history of humanity. And the problem I had with the first trip I made to Peru was the fact that I saw buildings of such phenomenal construction that what the archaeologists told me in terms of these tools bronze chisels and stone hammers, which were the highest level of technical sophistication both in ancient Egypt and in Peru were responsible for all of the constructions I was looking at. And so through the course of time, I've had the ability to bring engineers, stonemasons, geologists, and other experts outside of the archaeological field in to look at them and tell, them from their, tell me from their perspective how this was done, and 100% of the time, they said that those tools could not have been responsible. And it clearly was not cultures afterwards because of the great antiquity. So what I'd like to start you with is the Inca. The Inca were the largest civilization in pre-Columbian America, 
But nobody actually knows where the other other game cut out cutout stones like this. And the weathering on this is so excessive that I'm hoping that Dr. Robert Schock will come <clears throat> in July of, uh, of next year and be able to tell us when the stone cutting was actually achieved. Because it's not like there are one or ten or fifty stones like this. In the area of Cusco and the Sacred Valley, according to Jesus Gomara, who is the local expert, there are more than 5,000 of them. So when people say this was an Inca throne, there were a lot of Inca, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is even more dramatic because if you see the front, this one here, and that one, and even the one in behind, at one time all three were interconnected. Something happened to this massive stone with an upside down staircase. It's, as it's much larger than a bus. Something caused it to snap into three pieces. It could have been a very ancient cataclysm. And again, we find like, just structure after structure, it looks molded, um, it, or like concrete or something. And again, you know, another example, as we get closer to this, which is called Kalamaru Machai, again, you see the erosion of it. This is very hard limestone, but it's unlikely uh, but we, though we need a geologist to corroborate it, it's unlikely that this is the result of weathering during the time of the Incas. It looks too old, and if you've ever been to Turkey, you see a lot of this kind of thing too. And there's talk of, of uh, sites in Turkey being thousands and thousands of years old, like Gobekli Tepe is. On the interior of this one, there are surfaces which are so polished, some people again say that whoever did the work applied some kind of high heat to it to melt the surface and make it glass-like. <clears throat> and this is another example of that. And here is a site called Pizak, and you can see that the wall in the front is of much higher quality than the work in the back, but it's all said to have been done at the same time. And how would you have people of such different technical ability working side by side to create such a difference in construction. And one of our favorite sites is in a cave uh, outside of Cusco. And this actually is not on the tourist map, and as far as I know, it has not been discussed by um, archaeologists much. It's, in, it's just an astonishing uh, sculpting of a stone surface with unknown tools. And inside the same cave, we have this, which is kind of inexplicable because it's a false door and it doesn't go anywhere. But somebody was able to cut into the stone surface like that. One would presume with reasonable ease. And again, we have the same kind of symbol, but what is kind of important about this is that what we see at, at most of the major Inca, so-called Inca sites, is you'll see three levels of construction. You see this, which is very precise cutting and shaping. Next to it, you have stones interlocking into it without mortar. And then in the back, you have mortar work. And the, the work in the back we know is Inca, but whoever did this other, we honestly, you know, we theorize, we tell you a story, you never interpret the story literally. When they tell you something, they're telling you poetry. So, for example, with Atlantis, the idea that there was a continent that sank is probably not the case, because any oceanographer will laugh at you. But, if you interpret it as being the water rose and the land appeared to sink, then that is a logical um, possibility. Because any advanced civilization in modern times in general lives near the ocean or has access to the ocean. So if you have a rise of 350 feet in three years, you're causing probably any sophisticated population to have to move very rapidly from where they are. So I believe in the concept of Atlantis, not the name, but I think it was a global civilization. And another writer called Barbara Han Clow, based on Alan and Dallaire's work, but also based on the fact that her grandfather was a native Cherokee, she was able to take both the science and the oral tradition and put them together in timeline. And again, 
11,500 to 11,700 years ago, there was a terrible event that happened on the planet. And some speculate that even what happened is that not only the melting of the poles, but also that's when our planet went from perfect alignment to 23 and a half degrees. The consequence of that is not only the fact that, well, is the fact that you would go from two seasons to four, almost instantaneously. That would disrupt, disrupt all of life on Earth automatically. Um, and then the work of Dr. Paul Laviolette, he believes that at exactly the same time, 11,500 to around 11,700 or so years ago, there was an ejection from the core of our galaxy. And his, his theory, which is backed up by testing in ice cores, is called the galactic superwave. And that's that rather than the center of our galaxy being a black hole, it's a pulsar. And what a pulsar do, does is it pulses. So his theory is that approximately every 13, 11, 12, or 13,000 years ago, it, it shifts depending because the universe is not a precise clock. But every around 11, 12, 13,000 years ago, there was a disruption or an emission from galactic center. And the energy of all forms, um, gamma rays, etc., travels through the galactic center. And at this time, it went straight through our solar system and it pulled plasma from the sun and hit the Earth in very specific spots. It was not like a big ball of fire engulfed the Earth because we wouldn't be here. But it hit high elevation sites, such as Peru, and it superheated the atmosphere temporarily. And that, he believes, is what caused the melting of the poles. Again, causing the rise in sea levels very rapidly, causing anyone alive to have to move. Um, Graham Hancock has done a lot of work at attempting to look at sites underneath the ocean, especially off the coast of uh, India and in the Mediterranean. And any time he's attempted that, governments have prohibited him from doing any work. <clears throat> but there is evidence from other researchers that inside the Mediterranean there are cities and off the coast of uh, of India, especially because when the tsunami happened in 2007, I think it was, supposedly eyewitnesses who were Indian fishermen out fishing at sea 